everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you all. It is my absolute pleasure to welcome you to the first in our 2021 series of topical big debates. This one, we are focused on the Brexit negotiation. I'm Sally Geyer, Global CEO here at World Commerce and Contracting, and I'm really thrilled to be chairing today's debate. Before we begin, I just wanted to remind you of and encourage you to use the chat function and the question and answer function, which you'll see at the bottom of your screen. We're really keen to hear from you over the course of the next hour. We'd love to hear your thoughts, comments, or any questions you might like to pose to our debaters today. We are going to save space for Q&A at the end of the session. And finally, just a reminder, as always, there will be a recording of today's session made available to you. So let's get on with the programme and introduce our motion. Brexit negotiations were doomed to fail. The resulting agreement is therefore a triumph of negotiation. We definitely would like to kick off this session by hearing from you. So in a second, you should see a poll appear on your screen asking you if you're in favor of our motion or you're against it. Possibly you're still undecided. So please do take a moment to answer that poll. And while we give you some time to consider your position, I'm incredibly excited to introduce our four debaters. Firstly, arguing for the motion, we have Professor Tim Cummins, our president here at World Commerce and Contracting and professor at the Law School at Leeds. Welcome, Tim. Um, it's always a lot of fun to pit you and Keld against one another. So um, I'm hoping A, you're there because I think you might still be uh, on mute and hidden away, um, but equally, how are you feeling today about the negotiations? Well, Sally, unfortunately we have this voting panel up here, but uh, if we didn't, I've got a nice big sign, vote yes. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. So with Tim arguing for the motion, we also welcome Mark Beer OBE. Mark is a lawyer and futurist, a transformative influencer in legal and justice. Welcome, Mark. Um, Tim feels pretty confident, I think. How are you feeling about your chances today? Well, good day to you, Sally. And today it's entirely down to the brilliant men and women of the audience who are going to vote right, vote for the right answer. Uh, vote for justice, vote for the future, vote for collaboration, and vote for unity. I have an absolute faith in the audience in, in voting in the right way. The right way, of course, is for Professor uh, Cummins uh, and myself. <laughs> Fabulous, Mark. Thank you very much. So, um, pitted against Tim and Mark, we have uh, Kel Jensen, author, negotiation advisor, and professional speaker based in the US, but originally hailing from Denmark. Uh, he also holds the auspicious position of World CC's negotiation expert in residence. Um, Keld, it looks like you might have your work cut out for you today. Yeah, let, let, let's see. <laughs> I do agree with Mark completely though. I, I believe in the audience. So I'm sure we're going to get the right result after, after today's debate. Fantastic. Uh, audience, it's down to you. Um, and last, but by certainly no means least, arguing with Keld against the motion, we welcome Rina Sengupta, founder and managing director of RSG Consulting, uh, creator of the Financial Times Legal and Innovative Business Awards program, and executive director of Digital Legal Exchange. Rina, I have no doubt that uh, you're ready to uh, challenge the men around the table as well. Yeah, no, thank you, Sally, and thanks for having me on. Um, I am looking forward to this. I have, uh, in the last week or so, got to know Keld a lot better and uh, got to understand a lot more about negotiation tactics. So, yes, I, I agree with my fellow um, debaters. It'll be down to the audience, but I'm sure the best arguments will win. Wonderful, Rena. Thank you so much. So... There are, without doubt, important lessons to be learned from what went on during the Brexit negotiations. Our debaters are clearly going to bring a range of perspectives to you. And while I know that you're in for a lively debate, nonetheless, we will take some time at the end of this session to extrapolate some of perhaps the more serious lessons from what we've heard. 
Um, I know we're all waiting with bated breath, very eager to get started. So um, I am going to hand over to Professor Tim Cummins. Danny, thank you. And thank you to our audience for joining us today. And thank you, Kel, Rina, for having the courage to enter into this demanding topic. This, of course, was no ordinary negotiation. Let's remember, it was a negotiation that virtually no one wanted, that an overwhelming majority across Europe hoped would simply disappear. Let us remember too that the initial negotiators were among that number. Yes, those sent by the UK were not in favour of leaving. And they, of course, were being instructed by politicians who overwhelmingly also were not in favour of leaving. So what other negotiation can you think of where one of the parties not only declared that there is no BATNA, no alternative to reaching agreement, they even wrote that position into law. Essentially, the UK Parliament was saying, well, we've come to negotiate, uh, but no matter what you offer, we're going to accept it. That is not a negotiation. It is an abdication. And that was the backdrop to the negotiations that began way back in March 2017. Turning for a moment to the European Commission, not surprisingly with that background, there was no serious intent to negotiate. Initially, understandably, they thought it was unnecessary. They were just waiting for the UK to implode, to move doubtless to a second referendum or some other device to change its mind. And even when they perhaps accepted that that wasn't going to happen, they felt that they had the upper hand and that they could impose terms. Now, many of us, certainly in our field of work, have dealt with people and organizations who feel that they have all the power and they set themselves up as a non-negotiator. Whatever you want, you can't have it. So for the next three years, there was endless behind the scenes maneuvering as current and former politicians, industrialists and others sought ways to overturn the results of the referendum that had led to these negotiations, ensuring that there was almost no incentive for the European Commission to seriously engage. With this backdrop, how can anyone argue that it was not a remarkable achievement to reach any meaningful agreement? My second point, if indeed I need one, is that we can't judge this negotiation by any normal standard. It affected multiple stakeholders with highly divergent views on what outcome would actually represent success. Even now, today, there are still many who want nothing more than to see Brexit fail. Much of the media appears invested in finding fault, rejoicing in problems, sustaining their position that Brexit is and will be an unmitigated disaster. Let me remind you, success is in the eye of the beholder. In this instance, any negotiated agreement was doomed to be seen and represented as a failure by a large majority of people. This debate is not about whether Brexit was right or wrong, about whether or not it should have happened. It is quite simply a debate on the fact. As I've illustrated, the facts are that this was an unloved, unwanted, non-negotiation that despite all the odds did eventually at the 11th hour generate a negotiated settlement. In doing that, it should indeed be hailed as a triumph. Tim, thank you very much indeed. Keld, I will hand straight over to you. 
Thank you, Sally, and thank you, Tim. Usually, um, I agree with Tim on so many topics, and in this case, I almost agree with him as well. Obviously, he did a wonderful presentation, and I would agree with 95% of the things he said. It was a very difficult negotiation. You do have two parties who had a very difficult negotiations, but I, I strongly disagree that we can look at the negotiation process as a success. Now, the way that Rene and I are looking at this process is that we're looking at at it, what, how is the process actually going? That means how the negotiators handling this negotiation, not so much whether they need to do this negotiation or they wanted to do it, but the techniques behind it. So it would be the same as looking at the doctor doing surgery. Is he actually successful in performing the, the, the surgery? And he might be successful and the patient dies, right? Or he could be unsuccessful and the patient could in some cases survive. So what I would like all of you to think of is, Imagine this negotiation like a married couple negotiating their potential divorce and future relationship. They got kids. And uh, while they are negotiating, the kids are watching the parents negotiating and have no clue what's going on. Sometimes one of the parents are being replaced by another family member who conducts the, the negotiation on behalf of one of the parents. And both parents share the content of their negotiation on Facebook and WhatsApp and text and, and LinkedIn and what have you. And the agenda is changing constantly and all the time during a four years negotiation process. On top of that, the neighbors are chipping in with some good advice, suggestions and ideas, and neither of the parents actually got the mandate to negotiate. So that means they have to check back with their attorneys and back office all the time. Every week, the parents are telling the kids that it's going to be a tough negotiation and we may end up in a, in a no deal where the consequence would be a total chaos. And they also tell the kids that there's a constant change of deadlines, and five minutes to the final deadline, they actually tell the kids, okay, we reached a deal, and it's better than no deal. I can promise you the kids are stressed out of their mind at this point. Now, um, I'm actually going to uh, present three things today uh, in my first and second part. And the, the first part is I'm going to share with you very briefly, and I have limited amount of time, what is actually a great negotiation. Um, then I'm going to share with you that a non-agreement was never an option. I don't believe a non-agreement was an option. I think there was always a plan that any deal would be better than a no deal. And then I'm actually going to prove to you that politicians are often incompetent in the science of negotiation. Um, and the first items I'm going to dive into is actually what is a great negotiation. And Rene and I, in our preparation, had some great talks. Thank you for that, Rene. And one of the things Rene came up with was that we would suggest that our honored counterpart today would prove without any reasonable doubt that it was a triumph to negotiation. In my book, a triumph is something that is 10 out of 10. It is remarkable, it is unique. And I have to say that studying this negotiation very closely, I would say on a good day, it was a four out of a 10 or perhaps a three out of a 10, but we were not even close to what I would call a triumph to negotiation. So a great negotiation is where you have identified a strategy. And, and in a negotiation, you can basically adopt either positional or collaborative uh, negotiation strategy. In this case, it was positional. In a great negotiation, the parties work closely together, and especially when you are in a partnership like this one. This is like a marriage, or right? it's even worse than a marriage because one of the parties here couldn't just pack their bags and leave. Europe couldn't pack their bags and leave. Where would they go? They are too big. The UK can't pack up the island and leave. They are dependent on each other. So in this case, you are stuck with what I call a smartnership. The parties are uh, so uh, interweaned that they have to work together. So in a, in a successful negotiation, we have to be open, honest, transparent, have agreed on how to negotiate, have agreed on the strategy, have identified the variables, and a number of other areas. I've actually identified, studying this negotiation, nine items where the negotiators on both sides of the table could have done so much better. If you want that in details, you can go to my LinkedIn profile and download it. I will mention a few of them during my and Renee's presentation today. A non-agreement was never an option. When, why was it never an option? Because we have a trading relationship with an annual value between the UK and EU of 660 billion pounds. I repeat, 660 billion pounds. So um, a non-agreement would be devastating for both countries or both areas uh, economic, and it could bas basically have created a, a recession even without a pandemic. Um, Stanford actually did a, a, a very thorough study at one point where they said that a non-agreement is just a load of BS. I apologize for my language, but they basically said that. 
So a non-agreement is never an option because you have two parties that are so dependent on each other that leaving each other without an agreement just seems to be enormously stupid. And I completely agree with Tim. This is a very difficult negotiation. And you might even have one side of both parties that don't really want to negotiate, but that doesn't remove the responsibilities for the negotiators to do an outstanding job. Kelvin, and that you leads to wrap up. Will you wrap I, up, please? But you can sure. have, have um, a couple of seconds to wrap up, please. I will. Uh, the last thing I just want to say is that I believe that any deal would have been better than no deal. And I'll get back to that in my second half. Thank you, Sally. Thank you, Keld, very much indeed. Um, apologies for cutting across. I'm keen to create parity and equity between our debaters today. Uh, they are limited to five minutes each. Um, Mark, I'm going to hand over to you. And thank you very much, Sally, and parity and equity, exactly what Tim and I are talking about. Let's go back to what this debate is all about. The debate, the motion for us today is Brexit negotiations were doomed to fail. The resulting agreement is therefore a triumph of negotiation. And I'd like to make two points. The first point is technical. The second point is historical. The first point is that this debate is not about whether negotiations were doomed to fail. That is not the motion that is before us today. The motion before us is whether, because they were doomed to fail, the resulting agreement was therefore a triumph. Put another way, if I say that all roads lead to Rome, therefore this is a good road, the motion we debate is whether it's a good road. If I were to tell you that each morning the sun will rise, therefore the day will be warm, the motion before us is whether the day is warm. We are not debating the statement here. What we're debating is the supposition. The word therefore becomes critical because for us to win, you need to share our view that on the basis that negotiations were doomed to fail, and I agree that that is a topic that we could debate another day, it's not the topic for debate today. On the basis negotiations were doomed to fail, we say that any agreement has to be a triumph. For Keld and for Rena to win, to persuade you, they must persuade you that even though negotiations were doomed to fail, a deal was at best neutral and at worst a defeat. To succeed, they don't need to be Brexiteers, they need to be brinos, stubborn, forceful, fighting for that independent United Kingdom, broken free from Europe, doggedly determined that no deal is a good deal. They have to show you that the UK fracturing apart from the EU, standing alone, they're not just having to persuade you of Farage, they have to be Farage on methamphetamines. That is my technical point. On the historical point, we have to look at history. We have to move beyond 1066, when the United Kingdom was invaded by our Gallic cousins, but we have to move to more modern times. President de Gaulle blocked the UK's accession to the EEC not once, but twice. Churchill envisaged a, a, a United States of Europe, but without the UK in it. Clement Attlee did not approve of the Treaty of Rome, saying, it's not our way. Anthony Eden, when talking of Europe, said, we know in our hearts that we cannot join them. Even Macmillan, who persuaded the majority of voters in the United Kingdom, or the majority of those that voted, to join the EEC, did not celebrate on the evening of the referendum why? Because his wife voted against him. It is a miracle, not just a triumph, that with that historical background, there was any agreement at all. And I certainly don't want to look into personalities of this. I just want to focus on the individuals that we relied upon to solve this problem for us. Barnier, described as the most dangerous man in Europe in 2010, described as Juncker's revenge on Britain, a German MEP said that Barnier was out to punish Britain full stop. Even El Mundo, a conservative Spanish paper, said that Barnier was full of ego and vanity. More, Kel, to your point, a divorce lawyer, 
than a powerful politician. But don't worry, the Brits had someone just as, dis just as disappointing on their side. Described as clueless, David Davis tried to strike a deal with Germany in the midst of negotiating with the EU. Uh, described as chaotic, he didn't even get on with his own prime minister, who herself was a Remainer. May was said by Junker to live on another galaxy. And they came up with this phrase initially by Farage, repeated by May in Lancaster House, no deal is better than a bad deal. We, Mr. Cummins, Professor Cummins and I do not agree. We say that given the history, given the circumstances, given the characters and the situation, a deal is a triumph of negotiation. If you agree with us, then vote for us. A vote for us is a vote for Europe. A vote for us is a vote for common sense. A vote for us is for a better alliance, stronger, more transparent, a vote for hope and a vote for a brighter future. Thank you. Mark, thank you very much indeed. Um, the, the sheer prospect of Farage on methamphetamines um, really brings all sorts of <laughs> images to mind. Rena, on that, on that note, uh, I will hand over to you to conclude this section of the debate. Yeah, well, I have to tell you, Mark, I have never aspired to be Farage on methamphetamines. <laughs> a few other things, but that's that's not my look. Um, so but how vote for us then, if you want. <laughs> so, um, so, so after all those, uh, those fantastic speeches, what what is the angle that I'm coming to this with? I'm not a lawyer, and I'm not an expert in negotiation, but I do run a business. And I, you know, am a journalist, have been a journalist for many years. And, uh, and for my sins, I also was a historian. So that's my background. But I am just a lay person. I'm a lay person looking at these negotiations. I'm every woman, if you like. And these are kind of my views. Um, so, you know, when the deal was struck on Christmas Eve, my husband called me into the bedroom and said, Boris, it's on the TV. It's a historic moment. Look, he signed this deal and he knows I'm very into my historic moments. When the, uh, the Capitol building in the US was stormed, I was on dry January and I definitely had to have a glass of wine and I broke it that night. But when I looked at Boris and I'm saying he'd, he'd uh, concluded that deal, I was like, mm, yeah. And I was sort of kind of unfazed. And he said to me, so what, what? I said, well, I knew they would do. They would get there. They would get there in the end. Of course they were going to get there in the end. Because actually, as Kel points out, um, you know, no deal was just not an option. Because if you think about 50%, over 50% 50 of Britain's trade is with the EU. There have been over nearly 200 kind of complicated sort of different trade agreements and bilateral treaties that, that existed. You know, it would have been absolute madness. And I think both sides fundamentally knew that um, deep down inside. And actually, given the fact that we had COVID, if you think about COVID, it made a no deal scenario even more likely because, and I can't imagine any politician in their right mind, be it Barnier, Frost, any one of them, um, you know, any of the negotiators thinking that they would compound the pandemic pain with a, with a no deal. I mean, you know, if you've got some stats here from the supply chain media, three quarters of European supply chains were negatively impacted by the pandemic in 2020. Um, and even since the deal has been done, since 2021, I don't know, I live in North London, my supermarket shelves are frequently empty, as are the, the, you know, the shelves in Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland. So we are seeing disruption, and no deal would have been just horrendous. And another point, a lot of the deal uh, negotiation involved brinkmanship. Right, everyone? Brinkmanship is a negotiating strategy that involves making a set of demands and sticking to them, even at the risk of losing the deal entirely. Brinkmanship can be used to gain more advantageous terms in a business deal, but risks alienating counterparties. So would you equate brinkmanship, particularly in this scenario, with good negotiation? But not just good negotiation, but a triumph of negotiation. Um, you know, there's a lovely quote from Tim Harford writing in the FT. He says, brinkmanship does not work if it does not create a risk of harm. Somehow, we have managed to produce a situation where democratically elected politicians are threatening substantial harm to their own countries as a bargaining tactic. 
And if you are finding this discomforting at all, you are not alone. Thank God it's not long range bombers. But surely a negotiation that involved the lives of millions of people in the EU and in Britain should not have been conducted in this way. You know, it should not have, you know, we should have been looking at the apex of negotiation tactics done with positivity and collaboration, where the populations of Britain and the European Union were not held as hostages. The other thing I read, Frost, David Frost, our, our final negotiator, gave his negotiators a four grid box, a matrix. Um, and it, in, in each box, it had a teenager, a tank, a mouse and a leader. You know, and, uh, and apparently the EU tended towards the first two, the tank and the teenager, and the Britain, the B Britain was too often a mouse. Now, as I said, I'm not a negotiation expert. I am a lay person with my every woman's hat on. And I do wonder in, gra in discussions of such gravity, whether such a grid was credible, useful or appropriate. But finally, you know, let's come down to this idea of triumph because I, I actually disagree with you, Mark. I think it is about, is, was this a triumph of negotiation? I mean, you may use miracle and you might say, actually, yes, it was a miracle, but that's not a triumph. What is a triumph? A triumph is a great success, it's an achievement, it's a victory. It gives you a great feeling of satisfaction and pleasure. So me as every woman, citizen of GB, it's quite basic. Those negoti negotiations, they stretched over four years. They were extended three times. I mean, no normal business person would think that was a triumph. But, and according to her, the Guardian, one British official likened it to negotiating in a 1970s car park. Now, I grew up in the 70s, uh, not that I frequented many 70s car parks, but I can honestly tell you that if I was negotiating in one, I would not think that that was a triumphant setting. So I have to say, I think it does come down, um, you know, and actually let's put it in your speak, um, Mark, that if you have any reasonable doubt whatsoever as to whether those negotiations were great and they gave you a deep feeling of pleasure and satisfaction, um, then you, know, you could consider that was a triumph and you'd have to vote for the other side. But if you have any reasonable doubt about that, then I think you have to vote for Calvin Lee. Rena, thank you very much indeed. Thank you everybody for the comments that are coming in. Um, one particular comment I'm just going to raise to our debaters just now is that um, David has suggested both sides are almost the same. The only difference is the last issue as to the level of success. You're playing a full house against a flush. So, um, interesting comments. Thank you. Please do use the chat function. Um, it's great to see your comments. Also, please use the Q&A function if you do have questions for our debaters um, after the end of this rebuttal phase. Um, so now I would like to ask Keld back to the debating stand um, for your rebuttal. Keld. Sure, absolutely. I would just like to remind everybody, both the panel and our audience, that what we're discussing is the process of negotiation, not the outcome, not whether we reach an outcome, um, but actually how did the negotiators perform on the stage? And as I mentioned already, I believe that a no deal was not an option. I do believe that uh, we also see a typical tendency that the average, and I'm generalizing obviously, politician is not that competent in the art of negotiation because their ambition might be a little bit different than achieving the best possible goal. And let me give you two uh, proof of that. One of them is I've been interviewing a bunch of politicians, both here in the US uh, and in Europe for an upcoming book. And I've been asking them lots of questions regarding negotiation. And one of the question is, uh, how would you describe a successful negotiation? And the answer I'm getting from everyone is in politics, a successful negotiation is a compromise. And already there, I'm disagreeing, but that's a different story. And then when I move on and say, could you explain compromise to you, how you perceive compromise? Here comes the great answer. Yes, a great compromise, a great negotiation is identified by the fact that we didn't get what we wanted and the counterpart didn't get what they wanted. 
Um, hallelujah. Imagine if we negotiated like this in the world. So two companies met each other. The negotiator returned to their headquarters and said it was a great negotiation. We didn't get what we wanted and the counterpart didn't get that either. Just based on that, I can say this negotiation was not a triumph. It was not successful. I have a colleague and a close friend, uh, Professor Daniel Shapiro. He is the head of the program on negotiation at Harvard University here in the US. And he's been running a small study at Davos uh, in Switzerland every year, where he, in six consecutive years, has have, had the opportunity of have 80 state leaders invited into a room. Listen carefully. He then gives them a very simple assignment. They have to divide themselves into 10 groups, appoint one leader in each group. And that one leader in each group, and there are 10 groups, have to negotiate with the other nine groups to pick one leader of the whole group of 80 people. And if they are not successful in doing that within three hours, aliens from outer space will come down and terminate all life on Earth. Now, this is a serious exercise. However, we are playing though, because I don't believe aliens will come down and terminate life. But the people involved in this exercise, and I've been there a couple of times, are very serious about it because it's state leaders that are trying to run this negotiation. And big surprise, ladies and gentlemen, they never managed to be successful in reaching an agreement. That means every single time Earth was destroyed by aliens because politicians couldn't negotiate. And the reason is simply, if you go back to my list of the items, the nine items that really identify why this Brexit negotiation was terrible, and again, I'm talking about the process, is they just lack a simple approach into how to negotiate. And the ambition could be very different than the best possible outcome for everybody. The ambition could be personal ego. The ambition could be re-election. The ambition is something else than actually the deal itself. So when negotiators get preoccupied in themselves and what they can achieve individually, obviously that will mess up the negotiation outcome. So this negotiation was not a triumph. Keld, thank you very much, Tim. I come to you now. Tim, you need to unmute yourself. Thank you. Um, I was negotiating in the 1970s, Rena, and in fact, I recall one of my most successful negotiations was in a broom cupboard. Um, I think a car park would have been a definite step up. So, we must give careful thought to our definition of success. Cal has talked a lot about process, and process is, of course, important and really interesting, but it doesn't, in and of itself, have anything in particular to do with the outcome. And in the context of Brexit, what did the parties actually want? I listened to great interest to some of the theories that have been put forward by our friends on the other side of this debate. Um, inevitably, in Kell's initial uh, comments, much of the argument was starting to focus on economics, on missed opportunities for value. And as the master and inventor of nego economics, Kell constantly and correctly alerts us to the underperformance of most negotiations, the opportunities that are left on the table. I fully respect his admirable work, and on that point, I can fully agree. Based on a purely economic judgment, the Brexit negotiations failed. But negotiations aren't always about money, and that was certainly the case here. What was win-win in this context? They were not purely or even primarily about money. They were about feelings, emotions, belief systems. They were about culture and values, things that are intangible, yet to most people of great importance. And on these matters, the outcome must be judged a success. The European Union protected its identity, its integrity. It had no wish to collaborate, as Held was proposing, because it wanted the UK to suffer and to be seen to suffer. Its goal was to ensure that other countries didn't follow suit. And for the UK, well, it remains split today, of course, as it was throughout this process. And many continue to bemoan Brexit. 
Yet for that small majority who wanted to leave, they achieved the restoration of an identity, a belief that they could shape the future rather than have it shaped for them in Brussels. Again, this is not about whether such feelings and emotions are right or wrong, but they are real, they are sincere. And the negotiations have in that critical respect met the aspirations of both sides. Tim, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Rena, over to you. Rena, again, just to remind you to unmute. Sorry, my apologies. Um, it was a poor joke about broom cupboard anyway, so I won't repeat it. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, I think we have to, you know, I think we have to come back to actually the, the wording of, of the motion, because in a way we are agreed that um, the negotiations were very difficult. It was a very difficult situation on both sides. I mean, obviously these, these are kind of the facts of what we were looking at and there were different personalities involved, et cetera. But I think, um, you know, if we're, we're talking about it, Brexit negotiations were doomed to fail. The resulting agreement is there for a triumph of negotiation. Uh, and I guess I suppose, you know, Keld and I do have a, a kind of, um, uh, uh, a problem with the idea of it being doomed to fail because fundamentally we both believe and you can kind of see that there was going to be there was going to be an agreement there had to be an agreement of some sort as, as we've outlined particularly um, in the light of of covid but the second half of it is the resulting agreement is there for a triumph of negotiation i mean that is we are tim actually talking about the process we are talking about the negotiations themselves and you know we're not actually uh talking necessarily about the agreement we're talking about is this a triumph of negotiation i mean the agreement you know i mean we could get into that and that would be another debate but and i cannot see given what we've both said both of us on on either side how we could really consider this a triumph but i would agree with you perhaps um you know, I mean, you, I mean, you know, we could use different words. Miracle, maybe miracle is a better word, but they're definitely, you know, miracle is sort of picking something out that that maybe shouldn't have happened and does, you know, you can't believe has happened. But triumph, a triumph implies skill. It implies something done very well, as Keld would say. It implies something that's ten out of ten. It implies great satisfaction and pleasure. I'll come back to that again. And this did not deliver on any of those fronts. Rena, thank you very much. Um, finally, Mark, it's over to you. Thank you very much, Sally. And it's a blessing to be able to wrap up with so much agreement between us. Uh, we agree, I believe, that no deal was madness. Uh, Rena, you called it horrendous. Uh, Keld, you said non-agreement was never an option. No deal was madness. We agree. Uh, we agree that the negotiations were terrible and they should have had you there, Keld. We agree that there was the potential for substantial harm. Uh, we love, I suspect, Tim, the idea of demonstrating negotiation with a picture of a tank, a teenager and a mouse and something else. What a terrible way to, to negotiate something so significant. We agree. Uh, we seem to agree about the 1970s car park, although I would love to hear the story about a broom cupboard, Tim, at the end of it. It's a pleasure to, to wrap up with so much agreement. And I think if the motion was, this house believes that negotiations were doomed to fail, we would really have a hot debate on our hands. But that isn't what we're negotiating. That we're taking as a fact, right or wrong, that is a premise. What we're negotiating is, on the basis they were doomed to fail, wasn't it a triumph that at the last minute, in the most terrible of circumstances, with frankly some of the most useless negotiators we could have found, with history against us in almost every way, wasn't it a triumph that we managed to get 
any agreement at all. That is our position, and I hope you'll agree with us. Mark, thank you very much indeed. Um, we are going to move on to Q&A in just one second. Um, first of all, what I would like to do is set that poll running again, and we'll have that poll open in the background. Um, let's see whether or not our debaters have managed to persuade you to stick with your original view. Maybe they've persuaded you to move on to uh, a different way of thinking. Um, there have been lots and lots of comments, lots and lots of questions coming in, and I'm going to try and um, filter through some of these for you all now. Um, I think where I'm going to start is um, with the question or a, a, a comment uh, from Yui Gross. So, to my belief, the negotiations were not a success um, just by looking at the time the parties allowed themselves to hold people and economy in a permanent state of uncertainty. Um, and it has resulted in negative effects of, of um, many kinds. I think, uh, that, and there have been lots and lots of comments. Tony, <laughs> Tony Alcock has just um, made the statement that Marks and Spencer's closed their food store in the 19th arrondissement of Paris today. Um, I'm sorry, Tony, <laughs> I am. I am. Um, we started these, and there's, <laughs> Mark, I can see you laughing. We started these negotiations um, with a lot of emotion. And I think Tim referenced that. Mark, maybe I'll come to you first of all um, about that point of emotion you've referenced and Tim talked about the emotion, um, the feelings that, came, that, that were so apparent with this negotiation. Um, Rena talked about the need for positivity and collaboration. We've also talked about openness and honesty and transparency. None of those things existed in this negotiation. Well, I'm not sure what the question was, but if I, I think the look, this was a this was a tragedy on so many levels. This didn't just divide households. This divides divided villages, and this doesn't didn't just divide villages. This divided countries, uh, not just the UK, but uh, within the UK, uh, Wales and Scotland were divided from the for, for, from England, um, and we divided a continent. For what? You know, for what? And history will tell us whether Brexit is a good or a bad thing. And people's views are now so entrenched that there's little point negotiating, although I you know, defer to Keld on, on that point. But what we've done is we have taken what ought to have been a well thought out and reasoned negotiation, not dissimilar to the Maastricht negotiation, which John Major had, not dissimilar to Margaret Thatcher's negotiation in relation to monetary policy and the currency. Tony Blair missed an opportunity, as we know. Um, there's much to be said if Cameron had negotiated not to have free movement of people for the new member states of the EU, it's very unlikely that UKIP would have risen to be the most successful party. And I say successful, I, I believe, in terms of um, the votes that they were polled to command. Uh, and it may well not have led to a referendum, but we all have a PhD in hindsight and we can all look back. Um, I do think, though, that it was on so many levels an absolute travesty. Uh, and it's left, uh, as I say, a continent divided. That said, you know, looking forward, we have to find some positivity in it. We have to try and forge alliances, even if they're not on treaty. We have to try and make trade free. We have to try and remove boundaries, borders and barriers from a world that's deglobalizing. And, um, you know, well done to everybody in the UK pushing for global trade. Excellent. That's fantastic. But why at the expense of trade that existed already? I don't know. I, I just feel I, I feel as if this will go down in history as an example of how not to do it but I am happy to persuade, be persuaded otherwise. Thank you, Mark. Um, Keld, I've got a question for you. Um, without wishing to preempt uh, what you're going to say as part of your concluding remarks, um, the question from Claire is, what approach would you have taken for such a massive negotiation with so many parties involved and as we've said, so many emotions as well? Mm, that's a great question actually, because obviously I agree with everybody that this is, 
obviously a very, very complicated negotiation. Um, and I agree with what we just heard from Mark as well. There's, there's, there's so many emotions involved in it as well. And, and that's always a danger. The second that human beings start to get emotion involved in something, it's, it's always tend to be a bit more rational that it'd be more factual. But hey, we're human beings, so that means we are emotional. Quick question to, to uh, quick answer to that question would be, even before negotiating, I would have negotiated on how to negotiate. We need rules of the game. We need to agree on how to negotiate. And watching this negotiation from the sideline, thank God I wasn't part of it, it looked like a mess. And part of the reason that I sometimes see negotiation being a mess, not only this EU-UK uh, negotiation, Brexit, but other negotiations as well, is that the parties haven't agreed on how to negotiate. And negotiation is perceived very differently. Some people perceive negotiation like playing tennis. Other people perceive it like playing chess. And on top of that, Sally, we even have a cultural aspect here. We have Brits negotiating taught predominantly a, 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 a French delegation. And we can just go back in history and see how that has turned out always. So, I mean, that, there's so many things that need to be cleared out even before we start negotiating. And what these two parties did was that they just jumped in and start negotiating, full of belief on, on their own ability to negotiate. I was actually with a state leader um, last year um, I'm not going to mention any names. And he was asking me, so what do you do? And I explained what I was doing. And he said, why is there a need for that? You can just look all the information on how to negotiate up on the internet. And well, I think that sums it up how you sometimes find politicians being arrogant in, in through the art of, of negotiation because they, they believe they're great negotiators and they certainly don't have to be. Thank you, Keld. Um, Tim, uh, uh, I'm conscious of time. So a final question for you and um, Harry, what we're gonna do is um, if you wouldn't mind in a few seconds while Tim's answering this question, close the poll and we will announce the results of the poll um, in uh, after Tim has finished. So um, Tim, I want to raise the point um, that actually Sarah Willis has raised. Um, what exactly, was the triumph because I think there's quite a few people who are still questioning what the triumph really was because it's quite clear that um, and without wishing to get political or um, focus in on the rights and wrongs of what happened uh, there's plenty of people that don't feel that the negotiations were a triumph. So I think um, as we have um, all agreed, the positions of the parties were in many respects irreconcilable. I think one can raise all sorts of valid questions about whether this ever should have been even structured as a bilateral negotiation. It was probably one of those situations, rather like the Irish peace process, for example, that needed external mediation to try and build some points of common ground and to perhaps prevent, in many cases, the negotiators meeting from each other. Uh, we may well have had much more satisfactory outcome, but the point is, we didn't. <laughs> it was what it was. It was, as has been rightly pointed out by everyone, people, by politicians, pulling strings with particular interests. It was um, staffed by negotiators who had varying levels of sincerity and intent to actually negotiate. Yet in spite of all of those obstacles, in spite of all of the ingredients that appeared to be leading to inevitable failure, it did snatch victory from the jaws of defeat. Thank you very much. Um, Rena. I'm just going to um, ask for a very quick comment from you, um, because uh, and I, I think I know the, your, your answer to this question. Um, they had, there was no choice but to reach a deal. We had to reach a deal, but does that suggest success? Um, that is success in the, in the sense that they reached a deal, but I don't think you could call that a triumph of negotiation. And I was just thinking that maybe the last word is, I, 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 don't, I think it's this word doom in the, in the title of our motion, but I'm minded of uh, Lord of the Rings, the last film when uh, Frodo has to throw the ring into Mount Doom. And that is the end of a, you know, nine hours of filming and questing. And in the end, Gollum falls into the, into the mountain with the ring and the ring is destroyed. Uh, and, you know, and I was thinking to myself, if you snatch 
defeat or there is a certain kind of success I suppose that Frodo felt when that ring went in and he had achieved his success but was it a triumph no you know so I think you know um getting a deal out of um out of a situation that was doomed to fail cannot be deemed a triumph thank you very much um all of you right it's time to reveal the polls so um let's first of all um this was poll number one um so plenty of undecided um more undecided uh slightly more against the motion than were in favor of the motion um let's have a look at um where we finished up at the end of okay so against the motion quite clearly um, swayed opinion on our debate today. Um, so <laughs> congratulations uh, to Keld and Rena. Um, Mark, I imagine you're going to be marching to the, <laughs> the offices of World CC to challenge <laughs> the voting system at some point very soon. Um, I want to thank our debaters and take this opportunity. As I said at the very beginning, one of the things that we wanted to do, this was intended to be lively, fun, interesting, but it is very serious. And there are some really interesting points here. And I mentioned at the beginning, there are lessons to be learned. David says, do the panelists believe that this negotiation will be a subject in future academic teaching? Um, Keld, I'm going to come to you first for your concluding thoughts and the lessons that you believe we need to have learned from this whole experience. Mm. Yes, and um, thank you, Tim and Mark. I thought you did an excellent job. I, I um, as Mark pointed out several times, I think we all agreed most of the time. Um, just to answer that, that question right there, Sally, very quickly. Um, yes, I, I know it will be because I'm already using it at my university. Um, and we are really trying to take the whole negotiation apart to learn from it, because if we can do nothing else, we can learn from something that we don't think was done properly. So takeaways, I mean, um, Sally, I'm sorry, I could probably spend hours on that topic by itself, but if I could just highlight a couple of them, and I mentioned one of them already in my previous answer, and that is we need to have a strategy on how we want to negotiate before we step into a negotiation. Um, Tim, I really enjoyed your comment early on saying that we might have the EU that didn't even want to negotiate. And how on earth do you negotiate with somebody that don't want to negotiate? I mean, another recommendation I often um, share with my students and clients is don't negotiate with somebody who got a monopoly, right? Because your alternative is, well, there isn't any. So that just requires even stronger and better negotiators to set up the strategy and agree the rules of the game, how we're going to negotiate. So that's, that's one takeaway that I want to emphasize for everybody. These parties, both parties, and I'm not blaming one, but both sides should have actually set up a strategy, rules of the game framework on how to negotiate. Another thing that is a problem, and I understand there's a political negotiation, but Another thing I usually say is only negotiate with people who got a mandate. It is so annoying negotiating with a counterpart that can't make a decision, have to go back home, get an approval, come back to the table because you never know if you have reached an agreement. I do understand this is a political negotiation, but still I believe that the parliament could have issued a mandate to the negotiators with the framework saying, this is what we can go with. That's another problem that we got. Um, back to what, what Tim said earlier about necroeconomics. Um, necroeconomics just means negotiation economics. And it's really a very simple model that just is, is all about expanding the pie, trying to make two and two equals more than four. And I think in this negotiation as well, even though this is about emotions and feelings and politics, I still believe that we could expand the pie. We could still look at the values and the cost. We could still look at um, asking each other questions. And, and that actually moves on to, to my fourth um, takeaway. Um, in listening to these negotiations, it was a lot of argumentation, a lot of statements. And what we in general, and that is human beings all around the globe right now, what we are really losing these days is the ability to listen to the counterpart, seriously listening to what they're saying. But we have a tendency, and we're in a time period right, right now, if you disagree with me, you're dumb and I'm right. 
And that is so scary. And I saw the same thing in this negotiation. We are really not listening to the counterpart. Why do you want to do this? What is your interest in doing it? What is your value? And what is your downside? What is your cost? Really understand the counterpart. And then I would say, um, as a final takeaway, um, and as I said, a bunch of them, if you want to get more of that, just take a look at this page here, but um, get the right team. I mean, from the beginning, get the right team. And I love what Tim said, perhaps they needed a mediator, perhaps they needed um, a neutral part who could sit in between them and help them out um, uh, because the, the team was not working. And, and then another problem was obviously, as I tried to illustrate through my story early on, that they kept replacing negotiators. Then it was this guy, then it was that one, then it was this woman, and then they, were, and then they returned, and then it was the other one. And that makes things really complicated, negotiating with a, with a whole amount of, of, of different people. So um, that was the immediate takeaway, Sally. Um, there's lots Thank and lots you. of them. Thank you, Keld. Yeah, I think um, there's a webinar in and of itself um, on this. Mark, yeah. I'd, I'd like to come to you next. Well, I'm just wiping the tears away from my eyes, Sally. I don't know what to say. <laughs> I, I, I've just been forming a WhatsApp group. I've been taken off Twitter and I'm just forming a WhatsApp group right now to to make sure that the message lives on despite the... This, and I was pleased, actually, that actually Tim and I increased our vote uh, from the first time around. But, um, you know, I think the voting infrastructure does need careful scrutiny. Um, and, and, and we'll be filing a petition for judicial <laughs> review in due course. Um, no, in all seriousness, I absolutely loved it. It's always incredibly difficult on these motions. Whoever designed the, 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 the motion did a fantastic job of creating sufficient complexity for all of us to grab onto. Uh, it really was a lot of fun. Thank you, Sally, and, and the team for organizing it. Tim, always a pleasure. I'm glad we were on the same side. But ultimately, we were up against the, the, the negotiator in situ, the resident expert negotiator, uh, and Rena, who, as she said, spoke for, spoke, speaks not just for every woman, but every citizen in her perspectives. And I think at the end of the day, Tim, we, were, we, we weren't robbed. We, 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 uh, we, we did the best we could in a difficult situation. So well done to everyone. Mark, thank you very much. Um, Rena, just a few final thoughts from you, lessons learned. Uh, one that actually I really enjoy debating. I haven't done it since I was about 14, actually for the abolition of the GLC. Can I remember? I think I won that one too, but it still got <laughs> abolished. Um, I think it's been fascinating. And to hear about, um, you know, the actually to think about to think about it in terms of the negotiation lens that um, we sort of learned so much about from Cal. And I think you're absolutely right. Thanks, Sally, for organising it. Um, but uh, I, yeah, I think our big takeaway was don't let politicians negotiate really important agreements <laughs> was, was one, the one thing that we'd all kind of agreed. But thanks very much. Thank you so much, Rina. Tim, um, 30 seconds, final few thoughts from you. Oh, thank you uh, to all of those who joined us on the debate audience and panelists. I think uh, our purpose with this, of course, was absolutely to try to open up thinking minds to fundamental characteristics of negotiation and planning, uh, certainly trying to find common ground. All of these things are fundamental. I firmly believe that the only real way through here would have been, in fact, a mediation. But of course, both parties would have been far too proud to acknowledge that there was a readiness or a, a need to bring in a third party. But uh, we deliberately made this a somewhat provocative title um, because, of course, it, it was good as part of that that we have winner and loser from the debating point of view. But um, could one ever argue that really this was a triumph? No, but it was certainly a victory pulled from the ashes of uh, political defeat. Tim, thank you very much indeed. It's been an absolutely wonderful session. Um, and I'm gonna finish with a comment from Kate. Kate, thank you so much. This was amazing. It gave me a lot of perspective regarding negotiation tactics, regardless of the purpose of the negotiation. So I think on that point, debaters, you're all winners. Thank you very, very much indeed for your time today. Um, and um, oh, yes, final, final comment. I've just been reminded to um, let everybody know that we've got a vibe talk uh, next week with Emma Dutton, 
um, MBE. She's co-founder and CEO of the Applied Influence Group. Um, she's going to be doing a fabulous five talk with me on the power of influence. So please do make sure you sign up for that. Um, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us today. And thank you again to our fabulous debaters. See you all soon. Bye.